Um, thank you very much again uh, to John and to all of you for, for joining us today. And I am going to talk to you today about the magic of brands in the form of a sample lesson that I might teach at the college or my colleagues might teach in any of the colleges in either Cambridge, London or Manchester. OK, so the magic of brands is what we're talking about. Very brief introduction from me. I'm uh, Shoaib Ali and one of the assistant principals at the college. I teach business and I have taught a bit of economics before. I teach both the A-level and the foundation programme and I've also taught some GCSE at the college as well. So I think I am probably quite well placed to talk, answer questions and talk to you about what makes our foundation programme really unique and a really, really good option for so many students that we work with. So this is where we are very quickly. So if you don't know where DLD College London is located, um, my office is somewhere in that building there, literally opposite the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben. So if you're in the neighbourhood, you're all very welcome to stop in for a tea, coffee, chat, whatever you like, even lunch perhaps as well. So I think before I actually start showing you the kinds of things that we cover within the lesson, I do think it's probably worth just giving you a very brief introduction to what the International Foundation Program is. So we quite often refer to it as the IFP within, within the colleges, but uh, there are a number of different pathways available. Okay, so the Foundation Program at the college centers around key components, and I'll explain those to you a bit later on. And then there are various pathways which we've designed between us to allow students to access universities. So you can see here that they are quite broad and they have grown recently as well. So do find out more about them if you've got any questions specific to some of the pathways. But I think the most common one we have really is the business, well, the most popular I would say at the moment is the business and economics pathway. And I teach on the business units in that particular pathway but also the same business units are applied to say, for example, we have fashion management here as well. It's also worth you knowing the economics units within this unit or within this pathway will also apply to mathematics and economics and also to the financial technology pathway as well. So it's a modular system, much like university, and we pride ourselves on it being designed to prepare students for university level, um, undergraduate level, work. However, we do this in a way which is, we believe, characteristically caring, sympathetic and, of course, supportive, which is a key, which are key features of all our colleges. So just very brief facts, and we can talk about this in a bit more detail later on, if you would like. It's a one year intensive program. OK, so the foundation program is equivalent to three A levels recognized by over 90 universities. Increasingly, these are international as well as the UK but more than 90 universities recognize the one-year program as the equivalent of a two-year A-level program, which involves three A-levels. The English requirement is minimum of IELTS 5.0 or equivalent, and there is a dedicated university guidance service provided within the program as well, okay? So that's the general structure. So I want you to understand that I would be teaching this in a lesson with students from around the world and you know i've had classes of eight with eight different nationalities which from my perspective as a teacher is truly fantastic but also from the perspective of a learner is also it's just it's there's an education in business and then there's an education of being with seven other people listening to seven other opinions um, and seven other perspectives from different countries that in itself is also an education as well so i want you to know that we are super diverse in terms of nationalities and the program itself is really designed for international students and to give you an example of this i don't know how many of you are familiar with nando's um, but this is um, a really really popular restaurant i don't know victoria if you've ever had the pleasure of visiting nando's since you've been here john i imagine you have right oh yes <laughs> now, well. now this is this, i mean i think some of you may be aware of this particularly if you visited the uk and i do know that they have restaurants overseas as well in various other countries. But I think this is what we call a household name in the UK. I think every student who's 16, 17 of British origin will be able to tell you all about Nando's. Now, the thing is, that's not true for international, all international students. So if in an A-level exam paper, we have a business case study on Nando's, immediately international students will have to, may, not always, may be disadvantaged. 
So the way we've designed the International Foundation Programme is we will not pick companies which might be unfamiliar to international students. And I think that is a lot fairer, in my opinion. But we will pick companies, for instance, such as Apple, Coca-Cola, Samsung, Mercedes, household names that every student of business should really understand. So you can see immediately how we have designed the programme to be suitable for international students in preparation for accessing university. So um, if I was teaching branding, okay, one of the things I might start with is asking people to consider the brands that they associate with the UK, okay, because I think Great Britain is, is a brand, you know, I think uh, I, it brings me a sense of joy when I visit countries around the world and I see the flag and the Union Jack and various symbols that we have on clothing. So just if you take a moment to ask yourself, which, what do you associate with the UK? Think about it. I think there are certain things. You might see that I'm in my living room today and we have what I would describe as atypical British weather today. Okay, the sun is shining and it's very warm here today. So if you think that London is always raining, it's not true. We do have sunshine and the proof is there in my window today. <laughs> but when you think about the UK, I think some of these things should be popping into your mind. The royal family, you know, red buses, um, you know, uh, beaches, which are probably not as good as beaches in your country, if I'm being quite honest with you. <laughs> okay. So I think other things, when I ask this question, I hear things like Harry Potter and I hear the London Eye and Big Ben, all these iconic things which have, which have been present in the UK and have been celebrated around the world for many, many years. So my favorite brands that I associate with the UK, of course, are, does anyone know which, which car company this is? Aston Martin. Oh, well done, John. Okay, and John, do you know, indeed it is Aston Martin. This is pretty obvious, I won't ask the question because you can, if you look carefully, you can see there it says Burberry, but one of my favorite brands, okay. Uh, we have Burberry there. And then we have another brand, which you may or may not consider um, when you think about British branding, but we have Amelia Clark, who in many ways is a brand. And I think this is something I wouldn't stop saying to my students actually, that you know, our, as individuals, we have a sense of personal branding as well. We also have um, Rockstar Games, and this is very popular. You may know this. It's called um, Red Dead Redemption is the game, but Rockstar International is a very large um, and celebrated and famous gaming studio as well. So I think when we're talking about brands, and I'm giving you some of the examples of the brands which I enjoy, I think it's interesting to consider the fact that brands are all around us and they are what we call omnipresent. Okay, they are everywhere. And they, def in many ways, in my opinion, they define our society. We, as we associate certain brands with certain eras. So I think, you know, if you go back a few decades, Kodak, you may remember Kodak, if you're old enough, was a big brand. There was no such thing as Zoom. You know, Zoom is a, definitely a brand which is associated with COVID-19 lockdown. And then there are other brands which we are dealing with now, such as, you know, Netflix, of course, as well. I don't know if there, any of you are Netflix fans. I'm a big Netflix fan. And, you know, Spotify, again, that's not something which it's not a brand which was around a few years ago. So I think when we look back at 2020, you know, and we see images of Zoom and Netflix and maybe even Spotify, I think that will definitely be is what we'll associate with the time and era that we are in now. Of course, there are brands that evolve and we're all familiar with some of the iconic brands which which last over a, a series of decades. And we do talk about the theory around those as well. But another, you know, big British brand is Vodafone, which may be known by a different name, the telephone network may be known by a different name in your home country as well. I know that's true when I've traveled with Victoria as well. Okay, so if this was a lesson, of course, we, it's very important to explain all the terminology. And I think what we tend to do with our learners is we give them a lot of the glossary and keywords before the lesson. Because what I don't really want students doing is coming into the lesson and spending time just through going through their dictionaries unnecessarily and you know translating when they could do the translation before the lesson so i might have given this definition to my students beforehand and said look it's friday on monday we're going to have a lesson on branding here's a a, a, a whole set of notes which you need to go over understand the definition of a brand so when they come into the class we can stretch them in terms of their understanding and they are not sitting there going through 
word for word translation because that's not a good of good use of lesson time i'd rather that we make the lesson more analytical and more evaluative and things like this basic tasks can be done before class okay so have a moment just to think about your favorite brands and i bet actually they will say a lot about you okay i'm not i don't require you to share it but if you want to share that within the chat i'm going to be interested to have a look but if you just even just throw out some of the brands but i think what's clear to us is you know we all have favorite brands in various things so just maybe 10 15 seconds if you want to type them in and share them by all means do um i'm interested to see if we have any john if you see any that pop up do call them out what do So, uh, John, favorite brand from you? A favorite brand, I would say. Oh, I'd have to say Apple. <laughs> okay, I think Apple Apple is um, is a good one. I think it's a very popular one as well. And I, you know, working with young people, I hear a lot about Apple. And there are some people who are absolutely Apple obsessed. Yeah, I think we've all seen, you know, the queues of people who are queuing outside three or four days before the new iPhone is launched. John, that's not you. You don't queue outside Apple shops, do you? I'm not quite there, no. No, I just have a lot of <laughs> Apple products. <laughs> so it was the first thing yeah. that came to mind. And we've, we've got a few more, actually. Um, Vadim has said Apple, but also Burberry and BMW. Uh, Noel has said, um, I really like Tesla. Uh, T. Oh. Mai has said Mercedes, uh, Chanel and Hermes. Uh, Marjan, we've got Karl Lagerfeld, Apple again, uh, and Michael Kors. Victoria, Ted Baker, Dr. Martins and LG. So a lot of fashion and technology brands I'm seeing. I, I don't know whether we, I feel like I'm talking to a room full of my students because these are all very familiar brands that we talk about a lot within my, within my lessons as well. But those are things um, which we, which I'm pleased to hear. I'm pleased to hear Ted Baker as well, of course, because that's a British brand. I actually, not to name drop too much but as well, but I've, I actually know the Ted Baker uh, company really, really well. So that's really interesting. And I think what I was saying about Apple is, it's interesting because I, know, I've, I don't know whether you've had this experience, but have you ever sat in a room and listened to a debate between an Apple user and a Samsung user? It can get quite heated and people become quite passionate about the brands that they're associated with. So I think it's, um, it's really interesting to look at people's brands. And I think like it or not, we make a choice when we purchase a product and it says something about us. So whatever your favorite perfume is, whatever your favorite aftershave is, says something about you. Okay, your choice in breakfast this morning, the cereal that you have, if you have cereal, that is, that says something about you. At the same time, there are other um, products that we will consume. You know, I think I'd like to believe, and I'm sure every single one of us this morning have brushed our teeth, but the likelihood is we've used Colgate, Aquafresh, McLean, Sensodyne, or another large brand within your company. That's in your country, sorry. That's not an accident, okay? That's because Aquafresh, McLean and Colgate are actually all owned by the same parent company. So we have the illusion of choice, but within there, there are decisions we have to make. Are we interested in white teeth? Are we interested in, you know, deep cleaning? Are we interested in fresh breath or are we going for the full package? There are a lot of decisions that, that are made there which say something about our personality and our priorities. So there is a question of why there. So, in terms of the marketing mix and branding, one of the things we say to our students when we cover marketing is we talk about four P's, okay? There are, if you go to university, there might be seven P's, but for the purposes of the foundation program, if I take that back, we're talking about product, price, place, and promotion. And this is where we're looking at branding within promotion, okay? So promotion, branding would sit in the promotion section. So, Another thing which we talk about is brand and market positioning. Okay, if you can see this, uh, most of these examples are chocolates which are popular in Britain and it's probably slightly updated, but um, outdated. So we have a kind of, um, we're looking at kind of quality against price. Okay, so we can see that there are products here on a graph which would be low price, low quality. But I think what's important for young people to understand is just because something is low quality and low price does not mean that it will not sell. I think we all think of Apple and we think of Hermes and we think of Chanel. And of course, they are all up there. OK, high quality, high price. You are people of good choice, good taste. But in reality, there are lots of products which people consume, in fact, are more popular by virtue of their price and the basic economics, which are low price, low demand. So. 
I don't know whether if, if anybody knows, John, what, but what would you guess is the most popular chocolate in the UK? So happy to receive guesses. Um, what is the most popular? Would, any answers to that, John? I'll, let, I'll keep an eye out. Um, guys, post your answers in, in the chat and I'll read them out. Okay, let's see. I'll just give it 10 seconds to see if anyone's got anything. Otherwise, John, I'm going to go to you. So if you want to save John the embarrassment of, or the, the pressure of getting the right answer, do make a suggestion as to what you think is the most popular chocolate in the UK. Is it the most popular of the ones displayed or the one that I think is the most popular? Let's say, the one I think... slightly tougher because we like a bit of challenge in the Abbey Deal the colleges. So let's say um, all chocolates in the UK. I'm going to go for a Cadbury Dairy Milk. Good shout, not quite I'm right. Snickers as well. Oh, Snickers, it's not Snickers, but that I'm sure it ranks very high. How about a Mars bar? Nope. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a clue. It is actually displayed there, John. I'm going to go, ooh, Kit Kat. It is indeed Kit Kat. Okay, so <laughs> Kit Kat, well done, John. Third time lucky, is the most popular, or is it fourth? Is the most popular chocolate in the UK. And you can see here, the price is fairly low on a Kit Kat. The quality is not the highest. OK, so in terms of market positioning and brand positioning, I think it's really important for people to understand just because Hermes and Chanel have high quality and high price doesn't mean to say that they necessarily make the highest revenue. And I think that's a lesson which we not a lesson, but that's a, a message which we communicate to our students as well. OK, so um, some of the brands here have already been mentioned by as favorite brands, but I'm not going to make you map this. But in a lesson, we might actually try this. We might put the map out and we might list these brands and say, well, OK, let's map these in terms of quality and price. OK, so just if we look here, we can see, obviously, we have Chanel very high. I think uh, Bottega Veneta is very high, Stefano Ricci. There's not much here, but the obvious one, I think, would be Zara would probably be good company Zara. I like a bit of Zara, but it's probably lower in terms of um, quality or well, definitely in terms of price. And then we'd also talk about parent branding. And if you can see here, we have brand Omni brands. Okay, so I talked about cereal and choice and Kellogg's and you can see there's a whole bunch of cereals there under the Kellogg's brand. And, you know, many of our students and many of us, in fact, we don't think that we consume, we consume associated British food products or Unilever products on a daily basis. But when you look at how much they own, okay, you realize that actually we're not giving our money to as many companies as we might think. Okay, so Nestle, for example, own a huge variety of things. It's not just a case of, you know, coffee and, uh, and chocolate. Okay, they do a lot more. Coca-Cola own a vast variety of drinks as well, which I think most of us are probably a bit more familiar with as well. So I think there's a really interesting um, message here in terms of when you look at actually who owns the, the brand that you like. You know, if you think about famous fashion brands, and many of them are actually just owned by one uh, large French fashion house. So what I'm going to do is give you um, a, a rundown of some of the most expensive logos created. OK, so I think we all know what a logo is. If you don't, you can see the Alpha Plus logo there and there's um, various logos. But the logo um, is something which we associate with a brand. And it's something which companies take extremely seriously. They invest a lot of money in, they spend a whole load of time. And I think it says a lot about the company as well. So I'm going to give you a very quick rundown of the most, logo, most expensive logos created. Okay, so the first one is the Melbourne City Council logo, $625,000. I've gone for dollars rather than pounds, but $625,000 for this logo. John, marks out of 10 for this one, what would you give it? I would give it about five. Yeah, I think John's being a bit harsh. I quite like it, but fair enough, it's a subjective question. Uh, I probably wouldn't give it $625,000, but uh, yeah, if you give this five, I'd be interested to see what you give to some of the others. Okay, so equivalent to this is the London Olympics logo. So 2012, $625,000 for this. Marks out of 10, John? Ooh, there was a lot of controversy around this at the time. I remember the amount of money spent. I'm going to say, I'm going to say probably, well, give it a bit more, six. Oh, you and I have different opinions, John. I, I hate it. Uh, even though I'm a Londoner, I'd, I'd give this, for me, I was part of the controversy. <laughs> I'd give this one or two. But it's, again, it's interesting to see how people's opinions on logos differ. 
okay, but $625,000 for this uh, Olympics logo. I think this zero here is supposed to be reminiscent of the shape of London, but yeah, okay. Pepsi, $1 million, okay, for a new logo which they came out of, came out with, and we talked about how in the beginning there are brands which we associated with a particular era, but then there are brands which have stood the test of time, and I think Pepsi is one of those. So $1 million, you should have seen this before. There we are, $1 million for this, okay? Um, I'll leave you to, to uh, have your own assessment of whether or not you'd want to pay $1 million for this, but what do we give this one, John? Oh, it, it doesn't look very different from, from the old one as I remember it. Um, I, I would say probably oof, that's got to be a, a four or a three, I think. <laughs> right, yeah. It's, uh, I, I'd probably agree with you there. Four or three for me. Um, it's not offensive, is it? It's not a bad logo, but you just think for a million dollars, you probably want a bit more. But hey, the BBC, $1.8 million. Okay, here we go. I'll let you, uh, I'm not even going to comment on this one really, but I have to, I have to say I don't like it. So, John, this one? Yeah, but it's a ubiquitous logo in the UK, isn't it? So it's very well known. But in, in, in terms of when you look at it against the spend, um, you've got to say, I get a three. Yeah, okay, John's not very impressed, easily impressed, is he, with these logos? But yeah, I agree with you. I'd probably maybe even stay slightly lower, maybe a two, but... Yeah, you're right. I think it's something which we're all very familiar with. Um, and yeah, I, I suppose even you guys, the reach of the BBC goes around the world. Okay, this is an interesting one. The Australian and New Zealand banking group. So we've gone from kind of 1.8 million and we've jumped all the way up to $15 million for the Australian and New Zealand banking group. So $15 million was spent on the design and production of this logo, ANZ. It's not one I'm familiar with, I have to say. I mean, if, if I, I know that I'm not from Australia and New Zealand, but it's interesting because this is not a company as large as, well, as well recognized as Pepsi. What do we think, John? I, I am familiar with, with, with this group because I have spent some time in Australia. Um, and I, I would, against the price though, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't give it a great rating. I would say probably a six from me. Okay, six from there. Okay, so we're going right down to three now. So the money's getting a little bit larger now. Now this is the Norwegian Postal Service. Okay, so you wouldn't expect the Norwegian Postal Service to be spending fifty-five million dollars on this logo. So fifty-five million dollars for this. I mean, it. I like it, but fifty-five million dollars. Why, <laughs> John? Comments. I, I, I also like it, <laughs> but against the price, but judging it as, as a logo, I would say probably a seven from me. Okay. I mean, I'm with you. I think if, um, yeah, yeah. Seven relatively speaking, but yeah, $55 million. Now Accenture, which is, um, which is a, a consulting firm. And certainly if you arrive in Heathrow airport, I think you'll see the Accenture posters very, very quickly because they take a lot of space up in the airport. So I'm, I think you, whether or not you're familiar with this company, I'd be very surprised if you haven't seen this somewhere at an airport. But this is their logo for $100 million. I mean, I think I could probably make this on Microsoft Word. John? Yeah, it's, it's very blur, isn't it? It's, <laughs> uh, I, 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 there's a lot going on there as well, really, in, in, in a quite uninspiring design. Um, and, um, I would say probably four. It's very critical, John. Okay, so if you're ready to see the most expensive logo created in history, uh, does anyone know? Doesn't seem so. Okay, so I will tell you it belongs to. Yes. No, nope, uh, it's not Coca-Cola. It's actually BP. Because if you think about the Coca-Cola logo, it hasn't changed in a long time. Yes, they've probably adjusted it slightly, but in the whole, the Coca-Cola logo stays fairly constant. But yes, BP, $210 million. And if you are not familiar with it, this is what it looks like. Which again, I think is uh, it's nice, but for $210 million. John? I like the logo but it's a ridiculous amount of money. I would say probably a seven again from me. <laughs> right, so I think it's really interesting because this, the new logo kind of coincided with um, 
some negative spin around, you know, um, an, an oil spillage and a disaster for BP. So I think what they must have done is got together and thought, right, you know, we've, we're recovering from some bad press. Um, obviously, we need to rebrand. And I think when you look at this logo, you think of the green, you look at the, it almost looks a bit like a flower. It evokes feelings of nature, it evokes feelings of the environment, renewable sources. So I think that's probably what um, has justified them giving this such a large budget. But yeah, $210 million for this uh, element of branding. Um, you know, I think if, if I asked my students to create a logo and somebody came with this, I'd be very impressed and I'd probably give them high marks for, for creating this logo. If they then said to me, I'd sell it to you for $210 million, I'd say no. <laughs> but yes, there it is. That's the breakdown of the logos. So very quickly now, um, have a look at these logos. Um, and does anybody know what this is? Okay, we'll give you 10 seconds to guess this one. Any answers, type them in the screen. Any, do we have any, John? Uh, we haven't have any, had any answers. It's familiar it's to me, but I must no, admit, I, don't, I can't place it. Yeah. It is quite tricky. It's one which you're all very familiar with, but when you look at it on its own without the writing, it isn't. But that's actually the Marriott. Uh, okay. Yes. That's the feature of the Marriott. So Pepsi, we all know. Um, John, what's this? Nike or Nike, depending on how okay. you Okay, I, I was interested to find out whether you'd say Nike or Nike. Growing up, I always called it Nike, um, but my brother actually worked for the company and they would be in serious trouble if they called it Nike. I, for your information, it is actually Nike. Uh, which, what's this one, guys? Windows. We have, uh, we have Windows. We have Victoria. Okay, Windows, indeed. It is Windows and or, and or Microsoft. Uh, we all know this, Apple. This one? Anyone? Haven't had any, had any submissions. I will venture the Premier League. Indeed. Well done. It is the Premier League. Shell, Audi, and uh, of course, the most important of these companies is DLD College. Victoria, this one. YouTube. YouTube, well done. And then we've got Chanel, which we've had a mention of, and actually LG as well, um, which somebody mentioned as their favourite brand as well. So I'm glad that we uh, had that there as well. Um, I actually, I bought an LG TV about a month ago, which I think was a fantastic decision. No, two months ago, just before lockdown. And I think it was a fantastic decision because I'm getting so much use out, use out of it now that I'm in lockdown. But yeah, LG, um, really big brand. They actually produce a lot of things for other companies as well, but don't actually put, always put their label on it. Now, uh, one of the things I would ask my students, but because you guys are acting as my students today, is there were three words added to shampoo bottles in the 1970s, I believe it was, which doubled the sales of shampoo, okay? Just three words that were added to the bottle. Can you guess what the three words were? Or can you, do you know what the three words were, which doubled the sales just by adding these three words? So we've had quite a lot of uh, comments on this, uh, and I think it's guessing the brand, but the head and shoulders. Mm, it is a head and shoulders bottle. That's also um, kind of partial credit for knowing the brand, but that's not the three words uh, that were added to the bottle that were that allowed the sales to double. Okay, so this is an example is of it, head and shoulders. Is it wash and go? Uh, nope, it's not the brand. Okay, I'll give you a clue. It's in the instructions. Three words were added to the instructions, which doubled the sales. Victoria's quiet. I think she's one of those students who knows the answer, but she just wants to give other people a chance. I'm Googling. <laughs> Stop Googling. <laughs> okay, I will tell you the answer because yeah, I can two, tell you. Two in off. one has been, uh, been submitted. Ooh, that's a good, that's a really good um, guess, but that what those are not the actual words because if you think about it, two in one probably cuts down the sale of conditioners, but no, really good guess. Not quite the answer. I will tell you because I know Victoria's Googling and I don't want her to Google the right answer. The correct answer is rinse and repeat. Okay, because if you rinse and repeat, you're using twice the amount of product 
and therefore you're doubling the use of your double, you need to buy it far more often. Okay, so rinse and repeat. Whoever came up with that in the instructions was genius. Okay, okay. So I'm going to do a very quick um, activity with you and it's something I would do with the class. It's actually what we call market segmentation. So I will show you a particular product and we will have a discussion around who the target market is. And I think one of the reasons I do this is because I am a real firm believer though with that all my students, when they join the foundation program in business, even if they've never studied business before, which they don't have to, so you can join the foundation program having never studied business before. I think in many ways they are already experts. I think all of us are experts in business, but what we don't know is terms, theory and labeling. So we can have a good go at this. We might not understand that we're talking about demographic segmentation. And it's my job and the job of my colleagues to teach the correct terminology. But we do already have a lot of knowledge just because we live in our live in the world and we brush our teeth in the morning and we have cereal and we fly through airports and we have phones that are either Apple, Samsung or whatever else they might be. OK, so I will show our product and I will ask you some questions about this particular product. I will ask you to tell me the rough age, the gender, income, occupation, interests, um, and we might even give the person a name. OK, so it will make sense when I start showing you products. OK, so first one. Rolex, a Rolex watch. OK, so I do need you to contribute through the type uh, the chat um, function on this, please. First question, male or female, what do we have? Male was the first one that came through, usually male. male. Yep. OK, give me an age bracket, guys. What do we think? A minimum age on the Rolex watch. Not when I say minimum, obviously, you can have a 15 year old who has a Rolex. But typically, what is the typical age that someone who might have this for the man might have uh, a man might have this watch? Yeah, minimum age 25. Mm, 25 I, would say, I would say late really. 30s or 30. Yeah, I think so. I think late 30s or maybe even 40s. I don't really think there's an upper age on this because I think when people buy the watch, they tend to keep it for a long time. Um, John's got about seven of these. OK, so um, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> let's give the, um, any, any suggestions for names. Victoria, well, I think we've, we've talked about this before. What's the name of this uh, man in his 40s who owns the Rolex watch? This part this is always interesting. We've got George. Yeah, you know, it's funny enough, George pops up a lot. It's often George. And what's George's occupation? What's his job? Business, businessman. Yep. He works in business. He or maybe he's some kind of director, whether it's finance or something like that. OK, and George, who's in his mid 40s, who works in business. OK. One more question about George. Um, what kind of hobbies does he have? What does he like to do in his spare time? <laughs> this is exactly why I'd say he plays golf from Noel. Okay, so hold that <laughs> thought. Yeah. All right, so I, I quite like to, when I do my teaching, I like to find an activity which works for students. And, um, you know, I've I've worked in a number of schools now, and I think I've worked with students who have many students who go on to get top grades, A star, get into some fantastic, fantastic universities. So I, I do this activity with all my students when I teach segmentation, when I talk about branding, and I've probably I've, I've definitely been asking this question for over ten years. Okay, and I've been um, asking this question in different places around the world, and every single time, without fail, when I show this product and I do this um, exercise. About half the time George comes up, 100% of the time golf comes up, okay? So I knew somebody would say golf, and it's not an accident that somebody has said golf because we associate Rolex with golf, okay? You may not have ever thought that before, but you may or may not know that Rolex actually sponsor golf, okay? So yes, George in his 40s, um, working in business, working in finance maybe, you know, plays golf. OK, high income. And it's not an accident that we think that because, as I say, Rolex is strongly associated with golf. So thank you for that. You made my PowerPoint presentation work. <laughs> Noel, Noel also okay. mentioned they sponsor tennis as well, which kind of fits yeah, in with, do, with, do. with I can think of a, 
Yes, definitely. Noel's correct. When I was looking at the pictures for this, I typed in Rolex sponsorship and I could see Roger, Roger Federer as well with pictures of golf. So she's quite right. And I think she and others will understand the reason they do this is because golf and tennis are typically associated with higher income um, audiences. And that's really what Rolex are aiming for, which we all know. So Apple ties, I'm not sure whether you are familiar with this, but um, I did actually have a conversation with the marketing director of Coca-Cola about this a few years ago. So even if you're not familiar with the actual product, because I know it's not available everywhere, um, male or female? Uh, Noel says male. Mm, okay, that's interesting. It is actually uh, female. female. It is actually female. female. Yeah. Okay, and um, forgive me, these are not my words. These are the words of the marketing director, okay? And I, I don't want to offend anybody by this, but what he said was, we've designed the bottle to be thin because we know that women want to be thin. That's what he said, okay? So that's the way the marketing department uh, operates. For, it's owned by Coca-Cola, Appletizer. Age brackets, guys, what do we think? We've had it. Uh, 15 was the first one that came through and then we've got 30 plus maybe 50 I would say I'd actually say between those ages 15 to 30 it's difficult if you're not so familiar with the product but I'd say probably about 15 to 30 um, what's 20, her name 25. that's good that's that within the bracket what's her name and what's her occupation what's her job what do we think give me a name and an occupation Nicole Okay, Man, and what is Nicole do? <laughs> What's Nicole's job, John? A manager. Ah, oh, she's a manager. Okay, so yeah. sometimes it's funny when my, my students sometimes get a bit carried away and a bit too creative with this, and they tell me that actually, you know, Nicole works for George and she's a secretary, and it becomes a, a whole scandal. <laughs> That's what she does. What do we think Nicole's income is, high, medium, or low? Medium, medium, two mediums, three mediums, yeah. four mediums. <laughs> okay, we'll go with medium. It's a difficult one, but I would say medium. Okay, let's move on. FIFA 20, which is a, a, a game available on, on various consoles. And I, when I say it like that, I feel like I'm advertising it, but I can be sure you have nothing to do with this. <laughs> okay, male or female? We have uh, two, three males, four males, five males, six males. Yep, yep. Age range? Uh, 15, 30, 20, over 12? Yeah, I would say over 12 to maximum age. Well, typically top end age, I would say kind of late 30s, uh, possibly, mm. I think. Maybe a bit older, because I think what's happening is games are increasingly growing up. I think, you know, if you go back 10, 15 years ago, games were typically, there wasn't really not much in the way of a game which was designed for adults. But as that generation is growing older, games are also becoming more mature, as we saw with Red Dead Redemption or Rockstar as well. John, did you were you going to say something there? Uh, no, I'd agree actually. Yeah, I think I think especially FIFA something has a, it has a legacy of people who buy it every year. Uh, and I actually remember playing FIFA myself when I was probably about ten years old, and I'm now nearly forty. So that would <laughs> that would make a lot of sense. Good stuff. Okay, and uh, other interests associated with this. So what? It's, this is very easy. An easy question. What other hobbies does this person have? Does this boy have or young man have? Football, obviously, was the first one that came through. We have a couple yeah. of footballs. Yep, I think so. Sport and, of course, gaming and those kind of maybe action movies, those sorts of things as well. And yes, we are stereotyping. Yes, we are generalizing. And um, I don't want to obviously be uh, too simplistic or even offensive with that. But basically, that's how marketing marketers operate often, is you do work on the basic um, assumptions of what a typical customer might be. So Fitbit, male or female? Or both. Male on the same group. So we have mainly male, do we? Two males, one says both. Uh, well, and this both, looks like both. It's male. Mostly male. Yeah. I think this one in particular, because it's black, I would say probably male, but I would accept, I think both is also a fair guess as well. Mm -hmm. Age range? Twenty to forty. Over eighteen? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's a good guess. I think, yeah, I think 18 to about 40 would be a good guess. I think, sorry, John. Sorry, 20 to 30, 25 plus. Excellent, I'll accept those. I think in terms of income, we'd say probably medium to high because it's a nice to have. Other interests, of course, fitness, sport, healthy eating. This is the kind of person who probably spends a lot of time watching YouTube videos and recipes. You can imagine they have a blender, they might be buying nutritional supplements. Okay, all of those things are associated with this particular brand. Okay, this is um, an airline suite that is part of, um, that is available in Singapore Airlines. Okay, so who do we think consumes this, male or female? Or something else? It was both. We've had two yeah. both, one female. Yeah, you can see couples, there. Yeah. Couple. yeah, because you can see two glasses of champagne there as well. Obviously, this is targeted at, well, not obviously, but it may well be targeted at people with honeymoons on a honeymoon and again when my students get creative and carried away and excited by this as well they talk about uh, George and what was the name of the lady who consumed the appetizer I've forgotten now Nicole yep George and Nicole secret getaway romance <laughs> on the airline suite okay but this is definitely high income is what we would say if we're bringing it back to the theory as well okay so this is Singapore Airlines branding uh, what always amuses me about this particular picture is they're watching Simpsons I don't know if anybody noticed that. I don't know why. I mean, it's like not like the most romantic thing to sit there watching Ned Flanders and Simpsons on TV. Okay, so Happy Meal. Clearly, this is targeted at children, but one of the things I would explain to my students and when we talk about this is, as a parent, yes, this is targeted at children, but it's actually the parents who buy this. Okay, so there's a toy included. Um, income might be anything from low to medium, but at the same time, I think there are also people with high income who also have McDonald's as well. Um, and this relates to a concept which we call pester power, okay, because the power of children asking their parents for something is really, really powerful in branding and marketing. And this is why if you turn the television on after school hours, so three, four o'clock, a lot of it is covered with children's products, you know, games and toys, because they know that typically, you know, a child might be coming home and possibly you know, waiting for a snack or relaxing after school and watching TV. And that's when they're targeted, of course. But really what they should be doing is studying business, but it's not uncommon for children to be watching TV at the end of a day after school. Uh, Christian Louboutins, um, my wife would be the answer to this. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna speed up now, but because I think you get the idea here as well but there are definitely um, income and brands associated, different activities in terms of hobbies and style and preferences associated with this particular brand. Um, the BMW i3, which is, and we did have BMW mentioned as well as one of the um, favorite brands. What's particularly unique, not unique, what's um, a fe key feature of this car? Does anyone know? electric indeed okay well done so it's electric um and so that means that you know people who associate with this brand might be environmentally conscious or they could just be making a statement the fact that they've got an electric car okay so there are lots of things associated with this it's probably not i mean it's not massively expensive but i think people who buy this car are probably prepared to take a slight um i wouldn't say risk but um, they might need the charging station outside their house or they might need a house which is large enough to have a charging station or to feed the wire through. So I think income will probably be medium to high or high even as well. Okay, so that's enough of that exercise, but I just really wanted to point out that um, this is a, a supermarket which isn't actually, which is in the UK. Um, but if you think about the supermarket in your home country, um, it's quite common to find say the fruit and vegetables in the first aisle not everywhere in the world, but I think it, when you go to most supermarkets, you tend to have fruit and vegetable. And what I want you to think about is two things in relation to this. One is that supermarkets very rarely, if or in fact, supermarkets often do not have windows in there. So can anybody tell me why supermarkets usually do not have windows? Okay, uh, and a similar question, but the question with the same answer is supermarkets do not have clocks and they do not have windows. So if you could uh, just share your answers in the chat function, I'd be really interested to know if anybody can give me the right answer as to why supermarkets do not have windows or clocks. The, 
the, uh, the, the, the first two question uh, answers that came through uh, are not to distract you from spending money. Exactly, exactly. Great answers, very well expressed, okay? Because they, the supermarkets want you to be spending as much time in there as possible. And there is a lot of sophisticated studies that go into, psychological studies that go into the best layout of the supermarket. So when I think of my the supermarket that I go to in the UK, and ask yourself if this applies to you as well, Victoria, think about this. Where is the milk located in the supermarket? Is it near the front or is it near the back? I think what you will find is typically the milk is located in the back in the corner. And the reason for that is because I'll be on my way home. My wife will phone me up and say, look, we need some milk. Okay, I'll, I'll find, I'll go into a supermarket with the intention of buying milk. And I think you know where I'm going. I'll pick up a basket, I'll walk through. But as I walk through the supermarket, I'll be picking up all kinds of things on the way thinking, oh, look, special offer, I need some of those, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that I think is, is not an accident, okay? That's been designed in that way. In fact, what they've done before, it, what's not uncommon even, is placing cameras on the shelves to see where people's eyes are looking at on the individual shelves. And that's where key brands are placed. So they actually people, supermarkets will actually monitor exactly where people are looking within a supermarket and the typical route they will take and they will place products there accordingly. What is also not uncommon is you might take a really well-established brand, let's say, for example, Heinz tomato ketchup, place that on the shelf and then take the supermarket's own brand and place it right next to the tomato ketchup and put the prices fairly close to each other. So as customers are reaching for what they know, the Heinz tomato ketchup, they might hesitate and think, well, actually, that's a lot cheaper or I might go for that. So what I would be emphasizing to my students here is none of this is an accident. None of this is just because they're copying each other on their, on their own. There is kind of data, business and scientific um, studies behind how people operate within supermarkets. And it's no accident that they make so much money. Okay, so um, on this particular graphic, I would have talked about globalization to my students. And I think if what we're looking at here is in 1500, the fastest speed in the world was horse-drawn carriages. And then in the 1850s, we had steam locomotives, steam ships. 50s, we had propeller aircraft. And then in the 60s, we had jet passenger. So essentially what happens is the world is getting smaller and smaller. And I think we talked about Apple and Samsung. And if I said to you 100 or 300 years ago that I can show you in seconds, or we can have a meeting with you know, 30, 40 people from around the world, and they can all hear me in London, you would think I was a magician and you would probably burn me at the stake because you think this is some kind of black magic, what we're doing now. But the world is a lot smaller now. And I think that's what fuels brands. And to kind of get towards the end of this now, um, I just really want to point out what a trillion, the difference between a trillion and a million is. And I think if we look here, this is what a 50 pound note looks like on its own. And if you stack them together and have 10,000 to a million, that's what a pile of 1 million pounds in 50 pound notes looks like, okay? And when we look at um, 100 million, that's what 100 million would look like, okay? In piles of 50 pound notes. And then we move to a billion there. So if, if we had the first 50 pound note, sorry, there, that's a million. That's what um, 100 million looks like. And then we get to a billion there as well in terms of notes. But when we get to a trillion, this is what a trillion dollars looks like, okay? So there's 100 million and 100 million right there in the corner. So each of those is just 200 million, but that's what a trillion looks like, okay? And I think it's easy for students not to appreciate what we are talking about in terms of a trillion. Now, there are two companies in history that have reached a trillion dollars in revenue. Do we know who they are? Okay, two companies that have got to over a trillion dollars in revenue. Who are they? So we've had a, we've got a few coming through. One was um, Apple, Amazon, BP, oh. Samsung. Okay, well, actually the first two were the correct ones. Okay, so whoever said Apple and Amazon, well done to you. Um, they are Apple and Amazon. And I think the interesting thing is, I think uh, Apple took about 22, 24 years to do it, but Amazon have done, Amazon have done it a lot quicker. Okay, so yes, trillion dollars. I mean, that's what we're talking about. That's pounds, of course, but 
that gives you an idea of how large these companies are. And in my opinion, I think when we're talking about people like Jeff Bezos, we are talking about the equivalent of Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan because they are building empires. Okay, so um, just to kind of final exercise today is Coca-Cola has been mentioned before as well, and that is the logo, of course. Now, this is the kind of typical cup that we have here in the cinema or where you might watch movies or films, okay? So you know that um, when you go and you get this large cup of Coca-Cola, you, if you don't get Diet Coke or you don't get one of the other ones, there is some sugar in here. Um, and my question for you is how many packets, so how many sachets of sugar do you think go into this cup? Okay, so the question is, when you go to the cinema and you buy a large cup of Coca-Cola, how many packets of sugar go into this cup? Okay, I'm going to give you one minute to think about it. And whilst I give you the minute, I'm going to play um, what is a classically branded Coca-Cola jingle for you. So in one minute's time, I would like you all to have submitted your answers, please, in the chats, in the chats as well. So off you go, one minute. I'm going to ask you, how many packets of Coca-Cola, how many packets of sugar go into that cup of Coca-Cola? John, what do you have in terms of answers? Um, we've had a few few responses. Uh, most uh, are under 10. So we have four, maybe two, seven, nine, six, eight, uh, five. Uh, Victoria has said between 14 and 20. She's the outlier in, in this. Ooh, Victoria says a lot of sugar. Okay, so we're talking about packets of sugar. So, for example, when you go to a coffee shop and you add sugar on the takeaway and you get packet there. So it's quite interesting if we go through there. Um, Coca-Cola, of course, is an iconic brand, but the correct answer is this cup of Coca-Cola, if you buy the classic Coca-Cola, the one we just saw for the advert, not diet, then there are not just this many packets of sugar and not just many this, pack, many, this many packets of sugar. In fact, there are more. And by the way, this isn't accurate because I did actually add the exact amount of packets of sugar but there are more than this many packets of sugar. In fact, more than this many. If we keep going, there are 44. So even Victoria as an outlier underestimated how many packets of sugar, their equivalent, go into the cup of Coca-Cola, which you might have when you go and watch a movie. And the movie might be one and a half hours, two hours long, but it's like you taking a cup of water, opening 44 sachets or packets of sugar, dropping 44 times in there, stirring it up and drinking it all in an hour and a half, two hours. Now, <laughs> I don't want to scare you, but I think there is some magic here that Coca-Cola managed to make us feel good. And, you know, it's about families and Christmas and good times and sharing. But we're actually consuming 44 packets of sugar within that one cup there. OK, and I think there is probably some magic there for good or bad, but 44 packets of sugar. So I don't know what your reaction is to that. I'd love to be in a class when, and see your reactions to this, but that's, if you don't believe me, you can search this yourself. We have one very surprised face emoji <laughs> to give you an <laughs> idea. And how do yeah, they not make it like 44 packets? <laughs> yeah, there are, so, uh, okay. Um, so just to wrap this up, in terms of if this was a lesson, I might go through some of that material with a class. And then what we might do then is work towards an essay question because we do um, a lot of past paper questions. And I know that students really respond well to this. So we might then say, OK, we're going to look at a past paper question. And one of the questions which you might have in relation to branding and marketing is this. So discuss the view that brands are bad for society, which is a really interesting, meaty, meaty topic. 
we've gone through some material, we've gone through some theory, some key definitions. But rather than just say to students, off you go and write this, what we tend to do is give them very prescriptive, a very prescriptive structure on how to write this essay. So one of the things that we've designed within DLD is we model what we call the PCHJ structure. So typically we want the point. What is the point here that we are saying in relation to the question? We want the consequence, which is like the implication, and that's where the analysis comes in. We want the however to balance the argument because, you know, examiners and it's very important to have a balance of both sides of the argument. And then in each paragraph, we want a judgment as well because that scores higher marks as well. So we might say to students, you know, give us two PCHJ paragraphs and they know what that means. And I think it's really useful for international learners on the foundation program because we're not just saying, you know, write this essay and there you go, off you go and expecting it to happen without some kind of guidance. So this is really, really useful for our learners and it has allowed not just international students on the foundation program, but also A-levels to achieve A-stars and get into some fast fantastic universities. So our job as teachers is not just to deliver the theory, but it's also to give the guidance in terms of writing essays, because it's not always obvious. It's not just a case of write what you think. Okay, and in terms of the evaluation, this is what we'd ask students. So the conclusion at the end, we want students to say what the most important factor is. We want them to rank points. What does it depend on? Okay, so are brands bad for society? Well, it's a very broad question. What does it depend on? In both business and economics, we're keen for people to refer to what's the short term view, what's the long term view, and of course, other factors to consider. So we're talking about the 1920s. People didn't understand that cigarettes were so bad. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but I think the greater awareness has changed, uh, changed people's views. OK, so that's the kind of thing we would do again before the lesson. This is the handout that we would produce. So every single one of our um, lessons, every single one of our topics, we have this kind of document which we give to students physically and online. And it will say, look, these are the things that you need to know in this section. All the key terms, so for promotion, we have a little key there to make it very clear of what the definition is and people can annotate this. And we've got a section there on branding again with key ideas. And this gives you an example of all the topics that we cover within the um, within the business uh, unit, um, this particular business unit, and how every single one has a folder there, which is available to students, which has notes, presentations. We're not very precious about this. We share them very, very widely with students. Okay, so they have every single thing they need there. So that's what I would do for the lesson. Just to remind you of the structure. Okay, so we're talking about business and economics uh, foundation program. This one is an example. So 35% business, 35% economics. And then we have kind of the other two units made up of maths and what we call academic skills and research. So that's where some of the university guidance comes in as well. So it's a very broad program. And really what we are doing there is helping students to access the universities. So some typical universities, which our students tend to go to, and there are others of course that I mentioned, but these are some of the universities that have been accepting our foundation program in recent years. Um, and remember, it's one year access to um, some of these universities. Um, and it's graded in terms of percentages. So I think certainly if you're interested in the likes of City, you need to be getting 70, 75 percent. But every year we do have students who achieve those kinds of percentages. OK, Goldsmiths as well. OK, so really, that's um, a very quick rundown in a, a very artificial setting of what I would do in a business class. Um, of course, we don't have the interaction in the same way we normally have as well. But I hope that helps you understand not just the structure of the foundation program, but how we try to make things interactive, how we try to unlock existing knowledge of the students and how the one year foundation program in business is designed to really help students understand what they already know and give the labels and theories to things in preparation for access to top universities. Thank you for listening. I'm quite happy to take questions now. John, back to you. Thanks, Shoab, um, and thank you for a, for a fantastic lesson. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. I think thought it was a great um, interactive session and uh, really had a good time. Um, guys, if you have any questions, um, and thank you, Aruna, for saying thank you. If you have any questions for Shoab, please do, do post them in the chat or the Q&A um, and I will put them to him. Um, 
just to sort of start things off, Shoab, um, just from my perspective, obviously you talked about some of the fantastic university destinations that students achieve. Um, what kind of work do you do with the students individually to help them kind of achieve those destinations? Obviously they have to achieve a certain percentage, but what kind of uh, support do you give them with their university application uh, from that side? That's, uh, that's a really good question. So when I showed you the um, the graphic, which I've, um, I won't go back into now, um, we have a very kind of dedicated, we have actually have the timetable lessons for this because the ch on one hand, having the one year foundation program intensive is great for getting to university, but at the same time, it is very difficult to get the pro get the application done as quickly as possible. So what we tend to do is we have this unit called personal development, which happens, which is quite intense in the first term. So we start off by kind of giving students a questionnaire, asking them to identify their interests. We have a university fair, with, which we bring I think 30, 40, even more universities into the school, into the college, and they get a students get a chance to meet the likes of Imperial, UCL, Queen Mary, et cetera, et cetera, and speak to them directly. Um, we talk about um, the personal statement in great depth. Okay, so we encourage students to write drafts of their personal statement, and we look at, right, actually, this is where you could improve the English. Here's a book which you probably need to read and refer to. We link it to existing theory. And it's just, it is, I mean, the personal statement is, the provision of it and is unapologetically personal. Okay, we have to, there isn't a one, there isn't one way to write it, which is perfect for everybody, but we spend a lot of time with the personal tutor and within the timetable lessons of personal development, writing the personal statement. So students apply for five universities and um, they then have to choose two of those as their firm and insurance. But we spend, it's, 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 it's a key function of what we do and it's timetable within the lesson as well. I just have my, my microphone muted. Thanks, um, Shoab. Um, if anyone has any questions, I, I, I basically everyone's saying thank you very much, and it was a fantastic lesson. So, so <laughs> I think everyone's very happy and happy with the participative uh, side of things. Um, guys, what we'll do is please do post any questions here while I'm summing up, and um, and I'll put those to Shoab. Um, but we will send you obviously a copy of the. Um, presentation and also um, the video so when you receive that from our colleagues please do post any questions that you may have for Shaab or his colleagues in the business department or the foundation uh, program hit at DLD and we'll put those to to them for you so please feel free to ask any questions when you receive that um, but I think everyone's just saying thank you um, so I think with, with that in mind what we'll do is um, we'll sign off I'll say goodbye I'll let you say goodbye Shaab and then we'll, we'll finish the webinar Thanks very much, everybody. It's been really interesting hearing your opinions, okay, knowing all about George and uh, and his antics as well. So thanks very much. And I, as John said, if you've got any questions, then do put them back to us. And as I said in the beginning, if you just happen to be in London and you want to stop in for a chat or a coffee, then you are all very, very welcome as well. So thank you very much for being such a great audience.